Uh, my name is Jeremiah Fioravanti. I'm the president of the DCIS. <clears throat> I'm also a biology professor at Hack. I'd like to welcome you all to our winter 21-22 uh, virtual lecture series. Um, it's no small feat for an institution that was founded in 1833 and resides in a physical building in the heart of Media, Pennsylvania that was built in 1867. <clears throat> we are also all volunteer um, and of course it's a pandemic. <laughs> so, um, I want to encourage you all at this lecture to uh, get involved, uh, either through donations of time, effort, or resources. Um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Laura Gerton with Penn State and Dr. Dan King with Drexel for helping to uh, manage the technical aspects of these virtual lectures. Uh, our next uh, speaker in, in February on the 7th is uh, Russell Lasco. He's going to talk about Costa Rica. You'll hear more about that. But um, Dr. G, would you please uh, introduce our speaker for this evening? Thank you very much and good evening, everyone. I am Laura Gerton, a professor of earth science at Penn State Brandywine, volunteer at Delaware County Institute of Science. And I am thrilled uh, with the speaker kicking off calendar year 2022 for us. We have Dr. Amy Shell Gellish from Eastern Michigan University. So her area of research is the history of mathematics. And in 2012 to 2017, uh, she did research on mathematical devices at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. She continues to work with the Smithsonian in their digital learning lab and she is also an outstanding scholar, having one article recognized in Princeton University Press's uh, publication, The Best Writing on Mathematics in 2016. I could go on and on about her amazing accomplishments, but uh, we want to hear from her. So as we kick off tonight, please remember to put all your questions in the Q&A. This webinar will be recorded and available after tonight, but we've got the speaker here with us. So I'm going to go ahead and turn everything over to Dr. Shell Gellish uh, so we can hear about mathematical devices at the Smithsonian creating curves. Thank you, Laura. And thank you so much for the invitation um, and the museum for having me to kick off 2022. Wow, as a historian, that number sounds really big. Um, uh, I am happy to take uh, questions as we go along. So feel free to put things in the chat right away. It'll be monitored. And I am perfectly happy being interrupted if there's a question that is appropriate to answer right while we're on a certain slide. So don't wait with your questions if you have one that you think is important to have answered right away. I am perfectly good with that. So like was said, I um, am a historian of mathematics and I did research at the Smithsonian for several years. I love the hands-on part of the history of mathematics, mathematical devices and things like that. So that's what I spend a lot of my time working on, which is great fun. So um, we're gonna be talking mostly about objects that help scientists and engineers draw curves. So we're gonna be having one foot in sort of the engineering world and the history world, another foot in the mathematical world. But don't worry, there's only about three equations in the whole presentation, so you're good. So just a real quick um, history of the Smithsonian, all in one slide. Um, so there was someone named Smithson. The Smithsonian is named after was a British scientist, James Smithson. You can see his dates there. He crossed over from the 18th to the 19th century. Um, he was a bachelor, uh, never married, and had a, a, a a fortune, uh, he was very interested in the so, quote unquote American experiment. So when he wrote his will, he left some of his, his money to his nephew, but he left a lot of his money to the United States. So again, if you look at his dates, by the time he died, we were well into um, beginning the second 50 years of our nation's history. So he had never come to the United States, but he loved the idea of what the United States represented. So in his will, he left his money and it says, quote, at Washington, i.e. Washington, D.C., under the name of the Smithsonian Institution, an establishment for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. That is all he said. So he left all this money to the United States with one sentence of directions to do something that increases and diffuses or spreads knowledge. So that was right after his death, which was in 1829, uh, Congress authorized the use or the um, incorporating of the Smithsonian in 1836, 
The law actually creating this, the institution was passed in 1846. So you notice there's almost you know, more than 20 years there. So you might wonder why did that take so long? Well, with such a vague set of directions, do something with my money to increase and spread knowledge, the Congress didn't really know what to do. And they had a lot going on setting up a whole new uh, country. One idea was to start a college, in particular, like a medical school. And they went with that idea for quite a while, but they realized that that really didn't diffuse knowledge to the American people. It was very focused, if you think about a medical school. So eventually they decided maybe we should do some sort of library, museum, learning institution that was for the public. And that's what ended up happening was the Smithsonian Institution. And now the, ins the institution has a total of 19 museums plus the National Zoo that is in DC. Almost all of them are in DC. There is still a museum in New York City. Uh, so if you've ever been to DC, you know that most of them are along the mall. Um, the very first one is the one that's called the castle. And it does look like an old castle, red brick. And in the castle is Smithson's tomb. So after he died, his body was sent here. So um, there's a kind of grainy picture on the side of the slide of his tomb. So if you do make it to DC, do go into the castle building. As you walk in from the mall and turn left, there is Smithson's tomb right for you to enjoy, if that's the right term. So he did finally make it to the United States. So um, we're gonna be talking about science, obviously, so you ask the question, well, where, if I want to see science, would I go if I'm in Washington, DC? Many people know about the Air and, Smith Muse Air and Space Museums. There's actually two of them. There's the National Air and Space on the mall. And then there's the Udvar Hazy Center, which is out at Dulles Airport, where all the large planes are kept. Then there's the National Museum of Natural History. That's the famous one with the dinosaurs and um, the Hope Diamond and things like that. But there isn't really a science museum in the terms of like um, physics and astronomy in, in the true sense and things like that. There's no hands-on type of science museum that's not focused on natural history or air and space. But we do have a lot of that and it happens to be at the National Museum of American History. And that's where I worked, which always confuses people because I'm a mathematician and math historian and I was at American History. The reason behind that, actually once you hear it, makes a lot of sense. So um, the museums came about, matter of fact, we even just started, had a new museum just in the last few years. So we're always adding museums to the Smithsonian. The reason American History has the science exhibits is that between 1908 and 1926, the US Patent Office had accumulated all these models. If you wanted to get a patent on your machine or your device, you had to make a small working model that was required and you turn that in with the plans. And those were kept, they were never destroyed. So the Patent Office had more and more and more models and they started running out of space. They didn't want to destroy them. They're all US patents. There's nothing there that's from outside of the United States. So they were then handed over to the Smithsonian, whether the Smithsonian wanted them or not, for safekeeping. Since they were American patents, they went to what became the American History Museum. So this is an example of a patent for a dime that cuts metal. Uh, it's not all that big. A lot of them are very small. If you were inventing a large machine, you would make a patent that was small and to scale. You wouldn't send them the whole machine. And then you also had diagrams, plans, and things like that. So those were all given to the Smithsonian and held. And then in 1964, the American History Museum was inaugurated. And at that point, the patent models came out of storage and became part of the collections at American History. So that's sort of the reason why the science is at American History. Those are mechanical models, but they went across all different areas of science. So now we've added to that and have medicine and other parts of science that aren't in either air and space or natural history. This is a view of the American History Museum from the north side of the mall. 
So the mall with the parks is on the other side of this building and off to the right in this image or what would be to the west is the Washington Monument. So it is really the first one, the first buildings as you come down the mall. If you've seen any of the Night the Museum movies, contrary to popular belief, there is not a whole labyrinth of tunnels connecting all the Smithsonian's together underneath. When I first started working there, I was really kind of bummed. I was hoping that was true. Uh, most of the museums, uh, American history and natural history, which is right next door in a very similar um, type of building, the storage is on the upper floors. So in American history, the first three floors are the public floors, and then the third, fourth, or the fourth and fifth floors are the offices and the storage where all those things are. We do have huge elevators for moving some of our um, models and cars and things like that that we have in American history. Natural history has an absolutely immense elevator. I've been in it. You have to wear a hard hat to be in it. It's two stories tall because they're moving dinosaurs. So we, I guess, have the second biggest um, elevator, I think. Um, so uh, let me go back one. Uh, yeah, I guess that's all I want to see. Sorry. So um, I want to start with one of the items that we have in the collections at American History that I didn't work on, but I love it. And I just want to show it with you. So uh, this slide is what I was looking for. So what we have at American History is, like I said, medicine, physics, mathematics, and computing. So there is a bit of a theme there. Those are all the mathematical and mechanical sciences that don't find a place in the other museums. So in this picture is Peggy Kidwell, Dr. Peggy Kidwell, who is the curator of mathematics. She's who I worked under. And then the young gentleman is my son. He is 17 now, so he doesn't look anything like that. But if anyone in the chat wants to um, take a guess at what is on the table in this image, you have to look kind of carefully. Don't look at the little um, hint on the side. But if you look closely at it without looking at the hint, what are those? So if one of our moderators, if anyone does, I can't see the chat. Um, but what, what, what those no are? submissions yet. Okay, I'll give it a second. So you have to look kind of closely at them. There's a little piece of paper on top that are um, part of her work in, in the research of what she's doing. But if you look closely, they look a little bit like dollhouse furniture. And what they are, is if you look on the side, they're IBM sales models. And I, I, I just love them because they are basically scale models of the computer systems that you would have um, gotten in the 1960s. So if you remember um, computers, hang on. Um, computers were developed in right after the war. And in the 1950s, it wasn't until the early 1960s that you started having computers in corporations. And they were immense things. They would take huge rooms. A lot of buildings were not air conditioned in the early 1960s, but a computer system, especially one that had vacuum tubes as these did like old fashioned televisions would generate a lot of heat with all those vacuum tubes. So you had to air have air conditioning and special circuitry. So before you invested in a computer and one of these room size computers has less computing power than my PC that I'm working off of now. Um, you would have the sales rep come in, look at the size of the space you had. They would bring scale models of the computer. So again, all those red items on the table are one computer and all the different parts with the magnet tape drives. You can see there's three of those and the outputs and the punch cards, if you're using punch cards. So you had the scale model and you could lay it out and see how the room would work, where your wiring would need to go, where your duct work would need to go. Because you have to rebuild that room, put in air conditioning for that room and special wiring. So the salespeople for IBM would come around with these scale models and each of the different computers had not only a model number like the 5,000 or the 6,000, but a color. So you could also, I don't know, paint the room. So this is what's considered the red computer. There was the blue model, things like that. So this is some of the fun stuff that we get at the Smithsonian. Everything at the Smithsonian is donated 
by individuals, a lot of times by universities, things like that. Once something is donated to the Smithsonian, it stays in the collections. And that's not true of private museums. But since the Smithsonian is in essence owned by the people of the United States, they can't get rid of anything. So um, just sort of a fun story so you get a feel for it. When I went for my interview and my um, background check for the Smithsonian, I went into a cubicle that was in an old building, but it was a traditional looking cubicle. And I sat on a 17th century French couch. It was beautiful. I was scared to sit on it because it was so ornate. And I said, is it okay to sit on this? And they said, yeah, we've got so many that have been donated, people that brought furniture from France or England, you know, when they were coming to this country in the 1500s, 1600s, and then they get donated and they're not allowed to get rid of them. So they're in people's offices. <laughs> so it makes it kind of an interesting place to work. So moving on, oops, looks like, hang on one sec, I seem to be, oh, there we go, that's better. Um, I'm going to start talking about some of the devices that I specifically worked on while I was at the Smithsonian. Again, we're going to talk about devices that help engineers and architects and various people draw curves. So again, engineers, architects, people that build machines, machine tooling, all of those type of sciences and uh, arts need to draw curves. So I have a picture of a cathedral in um, Europe, very ornate. And you can see that it is, um, oh, excuse me, uh, has a lot of curves going on. So not only are there the ribs curved, the vaults that are being created in between those ribbings. So the curved ceilings have very precise mathematical definitions. How do you draw, for example, a diagram of that, that the people constructing the cathedral can follow to make sure your curves match on each side, are as strong as possible, are the curves that the architects needed? Because if your curve isn't exactly correct, it's not gonna be structurally sound and you don't want your cathedral to fall down. So how do you do that? The two building blocks for curves, drawing curves, constructing curves are straight lines and circles. If you can make those two things, then you can build off of those and make other curves that you will need, that architects need and draftsmen needs and things like that. We go into the kind of sections like the ellipse and the parabola and hyperbola, and then into even more specialized ones. But you need to draw a straight line and a circle first. Those are the building blocks. So which is easier to draw precisely, a straight line or a circle? So I would love, you know, if, if people want to put that in the chat and uh, Laura can, to, can see what people say, which is easier to draw? Now, I'm not talking just by hand. I'm talking precisely to draw a perfect circle or a perfect straight line. So Dr. Laura, are we getting anything? Not yet. And a reminder, everything goes in Q&A for this particular webinar. So if you have any ideas, go ahead and put that in the Q&A. Oh, we've got one that has come in. Straight line is straight line. And that is what most people say. So how would you draw a straight line? Right, that's easy. You just, boom, you grab a ruler, right? Draw a straight line. Well, okay, how do you know the ruler's straight? Someone had to create that ruler. How do you know the ruler is straight? Well, at the factory, they've got a piece of metal that's straight. Okay, how do you know that straight? Well, the saw draws, it. it's an infinite digress there. How do you get a straight line? It's actually nearly impossible to draw a straight line. Now, uh, if you've ever done construction work, like help to big, build a deck or something, you can take chalk string, string that has chalk on it, you pull it nice and tight, you pluck it, and that will put a line of chalk on your piece of wood that then you can follow. But that straight line that you're cutting with your saw is only as good as your hand. We need a precise straight line that a machine can follow because if you're building machinery, and, it, and you're trying to cut a straight line, something that's going to go into a machine in metal, you don't want it to have any waves in it because then you're gonna have friction and whatever your machine is, your train or something's going to, you know, it, that friction will cause it to seize up and malfunction. So straight lines are actually one of the hardest things to draw and circles are the easiest. 
which is very counterintuitive. Hang on one sec. There we go. So here is where the connection between lines and circles come into play and where a lot of the work on drawing circles and straight lines was needed was in the early days of steam engines. So here is a picture of a old fashioned steam engine with the large wheels and you'll notice all the wheels and then the connecting rods. So as those rods go around, they're straight, they don't bend, they force the wheel to go around. And then that wheel is connected to the next rod and we keep using straight line motion, pushing that circular motion down the line, down all those wheels on the train. It starts in the steam engine where you have a cylinder which builds up steam, has a piston in it, just like a combustion engine today. That piston goes straight up and down, but at the top, it's hooked to a circular item. So you have linear motion in the piston going to circular motion. That creates rotational motion down a drive shaft, which is converted to circular motion in the wheels, down those um, bars, straight line motion again, converted to circular. So in any engine, not so much in electric car engines, but in your combustion engines that we still have in gas burning cars, you are converting from circular motion to straight motion over and over and over again. And that's the connection that we need. So how do you draw a circle? Because if we can get a circle at the top of that piston, we've got ourselves going. So um, what we're going to talk about is three groups of objects that do that for us. Um, the Schilling kin kinematic models we're going to start with, then ellipsographs and spherometers. Many of those sound are exactly like they sound. So we're going to jump in going back to those steam engines and talk about kinematic models. So here are um, a couple just pictures I wanted to show you of what these models look like. The top left one and the top right one we will talk about getting back to in a second. Um, the bottom right one is actually a set of gears. And the other three besides the bottom right one are called linkages. A steam engine is also a linkage. A linkage is any kind of device that has straight rigid bars hooked together at some sort of hinge or pivot point. So it links a straight bar through some sort of pivot to another straight bar and you're translating motion through those rigid bars or links just like the wheels of that steam engine train that we saw a moment ago. So how did these work? These were developed by the Martin Schilling firm in Germany in the late 1800s. They are heavy metal. They're not very big. They're about 10 by eight inches uh, that were, most of these were used as educational devices for training engineers and draftsmen. And if you'll notice, they all have some sort of linkage on the top, and it's easiest to see in the top left picture where my cursor is, there is a hole that goes through the plate, and then there's a crankshaft on the bottom of all four of these. As you crank it, that linkage will move, creating whatever motion is that you need for drawing a circle, straight line, parabola, whatever it might be. So we'll talk about two of these in particular. So the first one is a very traditional Le Poisselet linkage. It's the most common one. And you can see that it's actually been used. The paper on it has been uh, marked so often that it's actually ripped. So this is from 1864. That's the original paper. It is now so brittle that it actually breaks. Uh, on the right is a modern diagram of what happens. So as I said, there's a gear on the bottom that creates circular motion. That's the circle over on the right. As it goes around, remember these linkages are stiff. They don't bend. The far left point is attached. So it pivots as the middle point in that sort of kite shape goes around the circle. When that happens, if you look over on the right, as you get to the top of the circle, that diamond is shrunk. And then as you go around the circle, the diamond is extended. And if you have all the measurements just right, the point on the far right end of the actual model goes up and down in a perfectly straight line. And you can see that in the diagram on the right where the arrow is. So as the circle rotates, that diamond on the top 
is squeezed and elongated, keeping that top corner on a perfect line. And you can see in the one on the left that since it's been used, that's where that mark has been scored on the paper and then it finally ripped through. So that is how you use a circle, which is easy to draw to make a straight line. The reason circles are easy to draw is all you need is a piece of string. You might have actually done this in elementary school, a pin and a string and you take a pencil and you pull it tight and you draw a circle. So circles are super easy to draw. You need them though to draw straight lines. So that's one example of a linkage. Here's another one. It's very interesting. It looks like two bow ties. And there's one on the bottom that does not move. There's also a gear on the back. The bow tie on the front moves in kind of a figure eight pattern on top of the bow tie on the bottom. So that seems very strange. And it took me a while to figure out how it was working. You can actually see just underneath the top bow tie, there's another bar that pivots. If you track the point, and if you see my pointer at sort of the base of the bow tie, what happens is if you look at the curve on the right, it traces this curve. It's kind of like a figure eight with a loop on the top and bottom. This is called a Watts curve after James Watts, the inventor of the steam engine. And as you draw this, right as you cross in the middle on that figure eight, there's a little tiny piece that is a straight line, just a little bit. But it's enough to create a straight line that then you can use in industry to make perfectly straight cuts in metal if you're constructing a steam engine or a car engine or something, you need a way to make a perfectly straight line because a ruler isn't it. You have to make the ruler first. So these are two ways that you can mechanically create a straight line and then score your metal or have a blade follow it. So the linkage we saw on the previous slide or this linkage, if you are um, a math person, the equation for the curve is given down on the bottom and the um, coefficients, the theta and the A and the C have to do with the actual model, how long the bars are and how tilted they can get. That would be the theta, how much angle you have as it does that figure eight motion. So you can change those parameters to get slightly different um, versions of this graph. But again, that straight line part is right where that figure eight crosses. So two ways to use a linkage groups of straight pieces of metal that are hooked together to in a circular motion to create straight line motion. Another uh, kinematic models, kinematic means motion to move, like kinesthetics. Uh, these are some of my favorites that also use circular motion. I'm gonna start with the pictures. You may have seen some of these before. These are the family of cycloids. Uh, there's three of them. The best way of thinking about a cycloid is think about a bicycle tire with a piece of gum right on the edge of the tire. As that tire rotates, if you ask someone to like draw a picture of where the gum goes, most people draw something that looks like this, but that would imply that the wheel has to move backwards at some point and it never does. So if you look at the middle picture here, the blue circle would be your bicycle tire and the red dot is your piece of gum. As that bicycle tire rolls, that red curve is the path that that piece of gum on your bicycle tire follows. That is called a cycloid. Well, there's actually three sets of those. If that piece of gum isn't right on the tire, but it's up the spoke a little bit off the ground, then you would get the graph that's shown on the top. So that is also a cycloid in the same family. And then if somehow that piece of gum could hang down below, like if you're riding on the curb and, and a spoke was hanging lower than the tire, it would go past sort of onto the street. That would be the bottom curve you have. The middle one is the most common cycloid um, out of the family of actually trochoids is the, gr all, the group of all of them uh, because it's been known for hundreds of years and it's been used in architecture for a very long time. So this is, I love this picture. This is a bridge from Italy 
It was constructed in the 11th century, so in the 10 hundreds, and each of those archways is actually a cycloid, which is amazing because the mathematics to describe cycloids did not come about for about another six or 700 years, but mathematicians and um, architects knew how to draw them mechanically, even if they did not have the equations for them. So this is an example of three cycloidal arches. Many bridges in Europe have cycloidal arches because they are known to be very, very strong. And that has been known for hundreds of years. So how do we actually draw a cycloid mechanically? Well, we can make a model just like the picture I had. So this is another Schilling model in that same group that I showed the link linkages of, but this one's not a linkage. It's the same idea. It's a brass model um, about this big, not very big, very heavy. This one has a glass on the top of it. There's also that crank on the bottom, which you can't see. As you turn the crank on the bottom, what you have is a disc that rolls along this bar. If you look very closely, you'll see teeth. So the crank at the bottom forces that, that was called a roulette to roll on its gear teeth along that bar. That's our bicycle tire. And you'll see a little radius sticking out with three dots. There's a blue dot on it that draws the cycloid where the piece of gum is right on the rim of the tire. Then the red one is the one that hangs past, goes past the tire. That's called a prolate or longer than beyond, prolate means longer, cycloid. And then the green one is where that piece of gum is up the spoke a little bit, a little bit higher off the ground. That is your curtate, meaning to curtail, to shorten. So that are those are the three trochoids. And you can make this mechanically without even needing to know the equations. So the mathematics existed long before the equations were ever discovered. And they are very complicated equations, as you saw from that previous um, Watts curve. They can be very complicated. So this is a, a very famous one. If you've ever taken calculus, any of the people out there that have maybe moved on in, in your science careers, this is one of the curves that you may have studied in a calculus or a Calc 2 class. Here are other versions of cycloids. So that whole group of the trochoids, which are things that roll along a straight line like a bicycle. But you don't have to, you can roll, take your disc, your bicycle wheel, and roll it around another circle. If you roll it around the inside of a circle, you have a hypotrochoid. If you roll it around the outside, you have an epitrochoid. So those prefixes, hypo meaning um, less, and epi meaning more, usually depending on how you conjugate that. And if this looks familiar to anyone, it is the same idea as the Spirograph toy by Hasbro that's been around since the 1950s and you can still buy. I have an old fashioned version and a modern version. These um, have the exact same idea. You can have the dot right on the circle, a little bit inside, a little bit outside, and you get these wonderful curves that do have scientific and engineering uses. Um, so here is a nice one. And a, I have my spirograph on the right. There is a wonderful theorem called Tusi's couple. So Al Tusi was a um, mid millennium Arabic mathematician who did a lot of wonderful work. He discovered that you can also draw a perfectly straight line. So there we are again. If you have two circles, if you have one circle and another circle that rolls around the inside of the first circle with the restriction that the radius of the smaller circle is exactly half the radius of the bigger circle. So that means if you took the large circle and take two of the little ones, they'd fit perfectly side by side inside the larger circle. And if you roll it, and again, take a little piece of gum on the, on the circumference and let it roll, it would go straight across. So on the left, I have a diagram. You can see a couple of the circles. If you take the one with the dot on the far left and start rotating that circle, you can imagine the circle dropping down but that red dot staying the same. So I took my um, spirograph and I got as close as I could 
to a roulette that rolled around the inside that was about half the radius. I couldn't quite hit it because again, this is a toy. And also the dots are inside and outside the circle. There isn't a way of putting my pencil exactly on the perimeter of the inside circle, but I got as close as I could and I carefully rolled it across. And you can see that on the, this is the very first time I did it, that's pretty close to a straight line, given that I'm working with a plastic toy that didn't have a way for me to attach my pencil right on the edge of the circle. But if you could make the inner circle exactly half the radius of the outer one, a spot on its circumference will draw a perfect straight line across. So again, circles are easy to make and we can use them to make perfect straight lines so that when we create mechanical devices, cutting cutting machines, we can get precision lines. Think of what we need for our modern technology, cell phones, watches, things like that. Those straight lines that are being cut in plastic and glass need to be exact. Again, any type of friction is going to cause wear and tear and heat and your cell phone, your car engine, whatever it might be, your laser that's cutting something important is going to start malfunctioning very quickly. Again, if you are a um, equation person, you can see the equations for that straight line and parametric uh, terms. The theta is how far the circle is rotated. The large R is the radius of the outer circle. The small R is the radius of the inner circle. So a lot of trig there, but it kind of makes sense. One trig function counteracts the movement of the other one as you move across as the left-right movement increases, the up-down movement decreases. So that's the reason we have a plus sign and a minus sign. A little bit of math there. All right, so let's continue with this idea of calculus and these models. If you've taken calculus, a really famous Calc 2 problem that many people see is this idea of, and I took this out of Stuart's calculus book, if any of you ever had Stuart's calculus. You have a silo and you have a cow or a goat or something tied on a string that's attached to part of the silo. And he walks his way around. The question is, as that cow unwinds, how much grass can they eat? What can they reach from their leash? So there's a picture of the cow on the right, and then the unwinding of that leash on the left, there's a lot of mathematics that goes into that. But you can draw that curve precisely without necessarily knowing the equations by using, again, a kinematic model. So here's where we're using straight lines. So this red line, because we're assuming the cow is always pulling on that leash and making it straight. So as it unwinds, it's a nice straight line. It's unwinding from a circle. So again, straight lines and circles is all you need to come up with this very interesting looking curve, which is called an evolute, to evolve or to unwind. So here is the kinematic model. It's also a cycloid. So you can see that same uh, circular disc rolling along a bar, but this one is engineered so that when you crank the bottom, the circle doesn't roll across the bar, which was fixed in the previous model. In this case, the circle stays still. That bar has gear on it, gear teeth on it, and it rolls, the bar rolls past or is pulled past the circle and around it. So the bar, uh, more and more of the bar is on the opposite side of where it touches the circle and it's rotating around. Again, you've got the three colors, the red, the blue, and the green. The blue is right on the bar. The red is behind and the green is in front. And we have the same uh, phrasing that we had before for these um, evolutes that, or in this case, an involute, that is the path that a string will draw as it unwinds from a circle. These curves we'll see in a moment are actually very important to a lot of engineering. So we are building up ways of drawing very complicated curves, again, from a circle, which is easy to draw, and a straight line, which is hard to draw. And again, you don't actually need the equations to do this. So what are some of the uses of these? Because this is actually the most interesting thing. I mentioned that a lot of these models have gear teeth. Matter of fact, they all do to some extent. Well. Gear teeth are the heart 
of any mechanical device. If you think of how many gears there are in a watch or a combustion engine, thousands and thousands of gears. And that is where all the movement happens. They need to slide together and slide apart from each other very smoothly. So if you have gears that are just squares or rectangular cuts, they're gonna bind. When you hit those corners, you're gonna have chunking and it's gonna be really chunky and bouncy, uh, causing a lot of stress, a lot of heat, a lot of friction that will wear down very quickly. The gears will get loose, you'll have slippage, all kinds of awful things can happen. So you want those gear teeth to be curved so they roll off each other with as little friction and binding as possible. Two of the most commonly used gear teeth are ones where the cuts either on the left, both the cut of the tooth sticking up and the shape of the valley are parts of cycloids. Again, that circle, that bicycle tire, rolling along with the piece of gum that architects have known about for a thousand years. We use those in precision gear teeth because when those un, when they wind and unwind together, you have very little friction. They roll off of each other. The other type, which has a slightly different shape that you'll see on the right, where the valley is more curved instead of uh, slightly flattened out, is an involute, again, that cow walking around the silo, that interesting curve we saw in the last um, diagram. So those two curves, which seem very kind of esoteric, are very essential to modern machine tooling to get the precision we need for all of our medical devices. Anything that has any movement relies on some sort of gear teeth. So that really brings it from the original development of linkages in steam engines up to precision um, tooling that we need today. All through these mathematical curves brought about by the connection between circles and straight lines and how do you convert from one to the other. Again, if you have any questions, this sort of ends the first sort of little topic. So if there is a question, that would be a great time, but I will just keep moving along and can stop if someone does have something. Dr. Shell Gallish, we're about at the 15 minute left mark. Perfect, because this was the longest part. So um, I'm going to talk about two other, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, types of devices that are used for drawing curves. These are curves that are used more in architecture, a little bit more visual um, uses. So ellipses, these are things that many people run into when you take algebra two or pre-cal, you often learn how to draw an ellipse. Uh, it is one of the four conic sections, if you take a cone and cut it, the most common is the circle. If you tilt where you cut a cone, you get an ellipse, tilt a little bit more, you get a parabola and then the hyperbola. Ellipses are, have been around, excuse me again, <coughs> for thousands of years. The ancient um, Greeks knew all the conic sections um, and we've, we've had the equations for them for a long time, but no actual engineering uses were really known until Galileo uh, over a thousand or almost 2000 years later. One of the most common uses of an ellipse is in architecture. Again, I have a picture of a bridge that has an elliptical archway. You'll notice it's much wider and shallower, it's not as strong. You don't see elliptical archways on large bridges. Large bridges often have the um, cycloid or circular or even parabolic arches. They are structurally more sound, but an elliptic one, if you want a low wide arch, like on the left, you'll have that. An ellipse is the mathematical curve that you have two points. Instead of a circle, it has one center point. If you spread that into two, the distance from a, one of those foci to the curve and to the other one, the sum of those two lines is always the same. Where you might know about that is the orbit of the planets. So the earth revolves around the sun, not in a circle, but in an ellipse with the sun at one of those foci points. So again, the distance from one foci up to the curve and back again, no matter where you are, is always the same, the sum of those two distances. Where that is used is an artillery. So if you have a gun emplacement in a fort for a cannon, those are not easy to move. All you can really do is rotate them. They're too heavy to actually roll. So the cannon emplacements on forts are 
often elliptical with the back of the cannon, and you can see in this diagram on the right, being off on the backside of that ellipse. And you can rotate the front of the cannon along that ellipse, and you have the mathematics to be able to sight along it and know where you're aiming. So those are two uses of ellipses in sort of engineering. The other one is in architecture. So you um, often have elliptical windows, or if you're trying to draw um, an architectural plan, if, even if you have a circular window, if it's on a roof, when you look at it from an angle, it'll look like an ellipse. So how do you draw an ellipse? Well, if you've taken like an algebra two class, you may have seen the equation for it on the top. Uh, it looks a little bit like the equation for a circle. A circle would have the A and B being the same number. So a, a circle is a special case of an ellipse. Uh, you can use some sort of graphing property like I have on the left, that's Desmos. Or you can, again, use string and um, a pin and a pencil to make a circle. So here I've, and I did this the first time, I've known about this my whole life, but I'd never actually used string to draw an ellipse until a couple years ago. And I was so excited that it worked the first time. So you take a piece of string, make it into a loop, put two pins in it, put, put the uh, string around it, take your pencil, put it on the other side, pull it tight, keep it tight and just draw around and you get a beautiful ellipse. If you only use one pin in the middle, that's how you get a perfect circle. As long as your string isn't stretchy, it has to not stretch too much, otherwise you don't get a circle or an ellipse. So these are very common, easily drawn items. But again, how do you draw a really nice one for machining and for architecture? Well, that's an elliptograph. So you could just cut one really nicely and this is one that is from the 1800s that was used by a teacher on a chalkboard. So you can just draw one type of ellipse. So we have models like that in the museum. A lot of them are, again, teaching models. But if you want to draw a better one, these are called elliptic or Archimedean trammels. You can sometimes find wooden ones in um, like handmade toy stores. What it is is um, two slots that uh, um, some sort of runner can slide up and down, and you have a bar that's attached to those two runners. You can change where that bar is, and then as you rotate it, you can see, um, for example, where the pencil is on the bottom right or on the bottom left, there's a pencil there. As that rotates, the two sliders go up and down, left, right, top, bottom, but they're at different distances. And at one point it's longer in one dimension, and then it's gonna be longer than the other. And that circular shape becomes elongated into a perfect ellipse. So that's an elliptograph. The top one again is from the 1850s. It was a teaching device, it's fairly big. It again would be held on a chalkboard, but you could pull the little pins out. If you see the little pins at the top of the wood, change where those are, put the pins back in, and now you can make a, a longer ellipse, has a bigger eccentricity, or a smaller one closer to a circle. And you can see on the far left, there's a spot to put chalk, and the little bit of white, if you can see that, is where the chalk actually was. So that would be held against a chalkboard in the 1800s. The bottom left one is from the um, turn of the century. It's a really nice one that an architect would have used, and it can make a full ellipse. The right one is an Omicron. Those were made all the way up into the 1950s. You can still sometimes find them on eBay. That was the most common one that draftsmen use and it only drew the top half. It's not very big. It was something that a draftsman could just use at their desk to draw on the lips because they are so common in architectural and machine drawings. So the biggest consumer of these would have been draftsmen for drawing them. Nowadays, we use CAD CAM or some sort of computer generating drawing uh, system. But up until the 1970s, those didn't exist. So ellipsographs, again, using straight lines, they're kind of like a, a physical linkage to then take circular motion and force it into another shape. So that's how you draw the other um, conic section, the ellipse. Then the last um, item, oh, here's a couple more. These do the exact same thing, but they get progressively more complicated. The bottom right one, you can still see that pivot where you have sort of a left, right, and up, down type of movement that is hinged so it can be elongated and shortened to get that ellipse. So they became really complicated in the late 1800s. These are, again, patent models. People are trying to patent them. These were patented. 
uh, but they were really never put into production. I think they were probably just way too expensive and probably too hard to maintain. My favorite patent model is this thing. And it is a failed patent. It was never granted a patent. The patent description is hilarious. It, it does like seven different things. It's like a Ginsu knife set. I could not, so I actually worked with this device. I couldn't get it to do any of the things that the description for the patent application said it would do. So that's the reason it was a failed one. It, it actually never worked. And a lot of patent applications are failed ones. But again, we keep all of them because they are an important part of American mechanical history. So we have some interesting things at the Smithsonian that never made it to the light of day, either too complicated or they didn't work or too delicate, things like this. This one, like I said, I couldn't get it to do anything it was supposed to do. All right, so I'd like to move on to the last measuring device. This one isn't so much about drawing actual curves. We're going to move into three dimensions, but this has an interesting application to science and industry, to industry today. So this group of items are called spherometers. You can probably guess what they measure. Spherometer means to measure spheres. So this measures spheres. So I have a picture of some marbles. Those are spheres. What could you want to measure about a sphere, whether it be a marble or a ball bearing or a cannonball or anything that is perfectly three-dimensionally round? Well, you could measure its mass or its volume. Those are related. You could measure its surface area. You could measure its diameter. All of those things need to know the radius. If you know the radius, you know the diameter. If you know the radius, you can figure out the surface area, the volume, the mass, and then you can do a whole bunch of physics with it. So the radius is the only defining part of a sphere, just like a circle. If you know the radius of a circle, you've got the circle. If you know the radius of a sphere, it's just a three-dimensional circle. So a spherometer is something that measures the defining characteristic of a sphere, which is its radius. Where this comes into play in science and engineering is if you have, for example, a curve, like I have in that diagram, that changes as you go along, and we wanna know how curvy is it at each place. Well, if we could take a region and say, a circle or a sphere, if you're in three dimensions, of radius five will roughly fit right here. And then in the next curve, maybe a smaller radius of three might fit there. And then the next one, maybe a two. And up here, maybe it's a, a tight curve, so it's a radius of one. What you can do is fit circles or spheres into each of those curves, come up with the radius of the circle that fits best right there. And then you can build through something called Fourier analysis, an equation of that whole curve. That equation might describe heat transfer through a piece of metal that maybe is going to be used in an engine. You need to know how the heat is moving through a two-dimensional plate so that you can determine electrical resistance and things like that. So it's important to know. The other um, item, and what I'm going to talk about, is to determine the curvature of lenses. And that's what I have in the bottom right. Lenses have been around for centuries. We think of glasses as being a fairly recent invention and lenses, but they're actually much older than most people realize. So that's the application of spheres that we're gonna talk about. How do you measure how curved a three-dimensional spherical object is? Because for your eyeglasses or your lens and your telescope, you wanna make sure it's not kind of more curved on one side than the other. Otherwise, you won't be able to see clearly you'll have something called aberration where you have um, little rainbow effects or, or distortion on the sides of a lens. So it's actually really important. Any of you that wear glasses or contact lenses understand the importance of that. So um, the spherometer was invented by a French optician in 1801, um, Cushois. So again, uh, the idea of having opticians is well over 200 years old. Um, the first actual eyeglasses were invented in the 14 and 1500s. They were very simple, made out of quartz, but they could still work to some extent. There's a pair of glasses on the far right that the Smithsonian have from the um, early 1700s, I believe those are. So eyeglasses are made of lenses. There's basically two types, convex, which curve outwards, and concave, like a cave, 
which curve inward. And you can have compound lenses that might be curved outward on one side and flat or inward on the other. How do you make sure those curves aren't you know, steeper on one side, like I said before? And that's where the spherometer comes in. So this is a spherometer. This is one of the ones in the museum's collection. Uh, they are very small items, just a couple inches tall. You'll notice a couple things about it. There is a little ruler or a scale vertical on the left. If you look closely, there's a circle again on the top with markings like a ruler on it. So there's two scales. This gives us two places of accuracy. There's a screw down the middle so you can rotate it. It's got three legs. And if you look very closely, it's kind of hard to tell in this picture, there's a little pointy thing underneath where my cursor is. When you rotate the top, that point goes down between those three legs until it hits the table or your sphere. So that's mechanically how it works. What it is, is something called a micrometer. If you want to make a really, really, really precise measurement, you take a screw that's really, really tightly wound. And you have to screw and screw and screw it just to get a little bit of movement. That's what a micrometer does. That is the middle of a spherometer also, a screw that is being screwed down, but it's so fine that it takes forever for it to move very far. You get very precise measurements. So, excuse me, here's a very simple one with just one decimal place of accuracy. You'll notice the little up in the vertical piece on the left. As you screw that down, it's measuring the distance of that middle point from the flat. So a little bit of the radius of the sphere that that would be sitting on. And we're gonna use some mathematics to then find the radius of the whole circle. So what would that look like? Um, here's another example of a very complicated spherometer. You can see that middle post on the left that would be screwed down on its three legs. This has three scales. There's the vertical scale, there's the circular scale, and it's broken. There was another scale across the top that would give you three decimal places of accuracy at like the millimeter level. So you can see a top view on the right, you're getting very accurate measurements from these handmade brass items. This one is from the 1800s. It was donated by um, Bowdoin College. You'll notice it's sitting on a flat piece of glass. That's called um, an optical flat. You use that to make sure that the, the spherometer hasn't been bent. You get the three legs to touch, and then you screw it down until it just touches and then you read off the measurement and then you can subtract that or add that to your actual measurement of a circle or a sphere in case it's been bent. So they always come with an optical flat to, so that you can keep using it even after it's been banged up in the field like this one has been very banged up. So that's the optical flat. You have three legs on spherometer because four legs is not stable. Think of a table in a, on a patio and it wobbles. Three points is all you need for a plane. So three legs is all you need to have a stable surface. So you use a flat to make sure your spherometer is zeroed and then you can go measure things, uh, spherical items like balls or cannonballs, things like that. A little bit of quick math. If you have um, three corners of, of an equilateral triangle and you have the middle point where that screw is going down, simple mathematics tells you the distance between the two legs is A. Um, or a distance to the center is A, the distance to the two points over the root three. So we know the distance to the center based on how far apart the three legs are. And then here's the side view that you've needed. The legs sit on the sides of the sphere and that screw in the middle touches the top. The spherometer measures just this little height called H, just that top crest, how high is that? And then it doesn't take a whole lot of mathematics to find the actual radius capital R of your sphere or your circle. That H is also called the sagitta um, from the Italian. So the equation at the bottom is given those measurements, the distance between the two points, um, <coughs> excuse me, you can find the, the radius of the whole sphere. It only takes about four lines of right triangle mathematics. So if you want to do that for a homework problem, you can. So that is the spherometer, how it works. What is it used for nowadays? This is the interesting part. Obviously, to um, grind mirrors, we don't use it 
by hand now, we use lasers to uh, grind mirrors and to grind lenses, but many amateur astronomers still build everything from scratch, including their lenses. So you can still buy spherometers. Matter of fact, I have a brand new one. Where they're used in industry, and I find this very interesting, is in the um, petroleum and pipeline industry. Pipelines, it's very important that they have good integrity. You don't want a thick spot or a thin spot in your piping because under pressure, that will be a fault. That's where you're gonna have a failure. So they take large spherometers and place them along the pipeline and you should get the same reading at every place because it is in essence part of a sphere just doesn't curve in both directions. Anytime that spherometer either doesn't touch or hits it, then you have either a um, thin spot or a thick spot in your pipeline, you know that's a spot that you need to actually, what they do is they either x-ray it or do sonograms to determine if there's something wrong with the metal there, if it's corroded or something. And that's a spot where they could have a potential malfunction, which you obviously don't wanna have in your pipeline. So that's a modern use of, a, of an older item that was originally invented for the grinding of eyeglass lenses. So I find that fairly interesting. I'm going to actually show you one last one. This is my favorite one. This was um, a spherometer that was uh, used by the uh, Naval Observatory and it went on a trip to um, South America to observe the transit of Venus. They need to make sure they could make new lenses for their telescopes. So this one actually went on that 1784 expedition and then came to the Smithsonian. So um, to wrap it up, here are some uh, websites that you can get more information from the Smithsonian. I believe they're also going to be shared in the chat if you want to um, grab them. Um, one is just American History. Uh, they have um, a blog post, which uh, researchers like myself write short, interesting pieces about all different kinds of things, not just science. So I have some items there and other people. So, so the O say, can you see? blog post uh, for American history is very interesting. And then there's object groups, a lot of scientific items with a write-up and the individual images of these things. So again, American history, you need to go through americanhistory.si.edu, not Smithsonian, they're, they're, the websites are not linked. So there's two places where you can get more, um, some nice actually images and information about science at American history. And I will say thank you by showing you the count because when I was working at the Smithsonian, we got the Muppets and you've never seen so many sedate museum people excited the day they were unwrapping the Muppets at the museum. It was like little kids and candy. So uh, thank you so much for inviting me and um, I hope to see you at the Smithsonian. Thank you so much for your lecture this evening. It, it's been fascinating. I want to get my spirograph back out if I could find it and start playing and drawing some straight lines. Uh, for those my students who, always say, oh, I wish they still made those. They do. <laughs> Go buy one. <laughs> we have um, several uh, comments, uh, certainly thanking you for, for tonight's lecture. And I do have a question that came in earlier I, I wanna ask. Uh, someone asked, what about getting a flat surface from something that was melted then solidified? Oh, melted and yeah, so, so that is very common. So um, for example, many mirrors, if you think of the mirrors used in large telescopes, um, what they do is they will melt, they'll take liquid mercury, so anything that's liquid, if you don't disturb it, will make a perfectly flat surface. So the way they make mirrors for telescopes is they take mercury, which is very dense, and then they will pour melted glass on top of it. And then as it cools, then that surface is very flat. They still have to polish it and they use lasers to make sure, but that's how they often make um, the, the original glass for large mirrors. So, right, you can do that. Now with metals, if you want a piece of flat metal, um, that doesn't work so much because you often get bubbles. The nice thing about mercury is it's um, liquid at room temperature. So you don't have the heating and the convective motion that you would have. So if you take metal and melt it, you don't get a perfectly flat surface because of 
bubbles and convection and it will dry from the edges, cool from the edges in and things like that. So to get flat metal, what they do is they get it soft and then they roll it between huge rollers. Um, I'm not sure if I answered the question, but you, like I said, that's how you make the mirror, the, the glass for mirrors and lenses and telescopes is using the mercury, which is liquid. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, someone else typed in the chat, what did medieval architects, master builders use to draw Gothic arches? And that's really interesting question. The idea of having um, architectural plans or drawings is a very modern idea. Usually what happened is you would have an artist's rendering of what the cathedral should look like, maybe what the hallway would look like, but it wasn't what you, we would think of as an architectural plan. It wasn't precise mathematically, it was artistically precise. And the builders, again, you would apprentice someone at age eight and they would spend their whole life just learning from a master. So they would build, so, so you didn't take math classes, you just watch someone else for decades do this. To build the arches, what they would do is they would build wooden models and they would sometimes use curves. Often they would eyeball it or they would use string to, they would, they would take pieces of wood that were flat, cut them in, into as close to the right shape as possible using some of these ideas like strings and things like that. And then make the wooden form and then place the um, blocks on top of it. That's the reason you have the keystone that goes in the top. Once you get the keystone in, then that forces all the forces down out along the blocks and you can take the wooden support out from underneath. So we start with a piece of cut wood and then the blocks and then the actual stone blocks. How that originally was cut was again, often more by hand. It wasn't precise the way we would think of it as being precise. So if you measure them, they're sometimes off a little bit on those curves. So again, not the architectural precision that we think of today but they would use some of these string and circular ideas for drawing a rough draft of it and then scale it up to a large piece of wood. Hey, thank you. And that looks like that wraps up. Oh, someone always sneaks in at the last minute here. Oh, no, that was just a thanks. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Um, appreciation for your response. and. Um, and I guess we'll conclude with this evening's lecture. Of course, this will be recorded and posted on Delaware County Institute of Sciences YouTube channel. Uh, and the link will to the recording will be posted on the lecture series website. And Jeremiah, I will turn everything back over to you now. Yeah, just uh, thank you so much everyone for coming this evening. I encourage you to come to next month's lecture on the geology of Costa Rica. I'd like to thank Dr. Amy Shell Galash one last time. It was very interesting. I think some of the models reminded me of sort of Buck Rogers spaceships and things, but the mathematics behind everything was fascinating as well. So thank you for coming and sharing that with us this evening. So good night, everyone. You're welcome. Thank you for coming.